Our next panelist will be the University of Texas. And this one certainly you can say good evening. <laughs> We're there. Good evening. Okay, if I stand on this side, Madam Chair. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and distinguished members, uh, thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Jay Hartzell, and I'm the President of the University of Texas at Austin. I also want to apologize you're stuck with just me today. Our athletic director is traveling and just couldn't be here. My goal is to provide you with some background and a bit of our thought process for how we arrived at the decision to provide a four-year notice of our intent to change conferences. Nearly a year ago, the UT System Board of Regents honored me by selecting me to serve as the president of the University of Texas at Austin. Based on my previous experience and service as Dean of the McComb School of Business, the board could trust that I would carefully and critically analyze every key aspect of the university in order to make decisions that I believe would best benefit our university, that is our students, student athletes, faculty, staff, and alumni. Such decisions also help the state of Texas as Texas benefits from a healthy and strong flagship university. Going back to when I took over from Greg Finvez and became interim president, one of the areas where I've spent a great deal of time is our athletics department. I've expended this effort not only because this is an arm of the university that provides financial support for educational programs beyond just funding itself. Athletics are also part of the fabric of our university, a source of school pride, gold brand, and reputation providing common ground for many members of our community, bringing us together. Since becoming interim president and later president, I met often with Crystal Conti, our vice president and director of athletics, and together we discussed the ever-changing climate in the world of collegiate athletics and its potential long-term impact on the University of Texas. I've repeatedly sought the insights and perspective of Mr. Del Conte, given his expertise and experience in college athletics, and Chris and I have been in regular conversations with the chairman of our board of regents, Kevin Eltife, as the three of us have considered and tried to shape the future of UT athletics. Over the same period, collegiate athletics as we know it has changed at an increasingly rapid pace. We've talked about this uh, here today. While many will agree that tectonic change is already underway, few will deny that the events of the last year have accelerated these disruptions and increased uncertainty over the future of college sports. Since last summer, we have seen a global pandemic rattle universities' athletic programs and their financial health. We've seen student athletes gain the ability to move more freely between schools through the transfer portal, and now to pursue financial benefits derived from their name, image, and likeness, or NIL. This has been supported by important legislation passed by this legislative body and those of several other states, even while there is no overarching set of federal rules, resulting in an uneven playing field across the country. On top of this, one can add a critical Supreme Court decision in June that casts doubt on the ability of the NCAA to regulate key features of college sports. Outside of this regulatory structure, critical changes have also been happening in the world of media and television, important components of all athletic enterprises, including collegiate sports. We've seen the decline in traditional cable subscriptions as more people, quote, cut the cord, juxtaposed against the demand for live events that can drive viewership. These trends and changes that are outside of our control led our leadership team to, to, to consider how to best protect and position our athletics program and its positive impact on our university for the future in the face of increasing risk and uncertainty. That was the right thing to do given my fiduciary responsibility. It's my job to look out for the best interests of our institution. And this is clearly a critical time to consider our future given that the Big 12's media rights agreement is set to expire in 2025. We had a window to consider a move to best position the university for long-term stability. The report in Texas Media, Texas media this spring that both of the current Big 12 media partners had declined to open renegotiations with the conference, instead preferring to wait until closer to 2025 to engage with the conference, exemplifies the kinds of signals and information that we had to weigh in considering what path would be best for our university. While our university has enjoyed a remarkable quarter of a century with the Big 12, we came to view that due to the changing landscape of college athletics and the strong position of the Southeastern, Southeastern Conference, that the SEC might be a better home for the university providing us with greater certainty and less risk. We began analyzing this, what such a move would mean for our student athletes, our fan base, our recruits, and the university overall. We came to believe that the SEC offers the highest level of visibility for athletes, some of the toughest athletic competition, stadiums that are more similar in size and capacity and attendance to ours, and of course, a renewal of the cherished rivalry with Texas A&M that started on the football field in 1894. 
As it turns out, moving to the SEC with the University of Oklahoma protects that rivalry too, which began in October of 1900. Last Monday, less than a week after rumors of this potential move swirled in the media, we alerted the Big 12 that we would not be renewing our grant of rights agreement in 2025, four years from now. In the interest of transparency, we told the Big 12 that we intended to honor our current agreement, but believed that notice now was the fairest way to allow the conference and its members to plan for their futures beyond 2025. Madam Chair, may I go for just another minute or so? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. On Tuesday, we sent a letter to the Southeastern Conference requesting membership in that conference at the end of our current agreement. On Thursday afternoon, the SEC graciously and unanimously voted to accept our request, inviting us to join in 2025. Of note, this shows that Texas A&M University reached the same conclusion that positioning UT in the same conference as Texas A&M would strengthen both prestigious and important Texas universities. On Friday, our Board of Regents voted to accept this invitation, and I signed an agreement that morning cementing the transition in 2025. Given today's remarks and the conversation that's unfolded, I want to set the record straight. We have and will continue to honor all agreements. We have not violated any Big 12 bylaw. We sent a letter to this effect this morning to Commissioner Bowlesby. For the University of Texas at Austin, this future move is the right thing for our student athletes, our programs, and our university in the face of rapid change and increased uncertainty. Again, our years in the Big 12 Conference contain some of our greatest athletics moments and memories. Our friendships in the league and their schools and their leaders are rich. I respect the charge of this committee at the same time understand that we live on the precipice of a new and evolving landscape in the world of college sports. Even while making decisions that provide the best opportunities for the University of Texas, we are mindful of our fellow conference partners, especially our fellow Texas institutions. We've worked tirelessly to accomplish what's best for UT Austin, and we did so in a manner that gives ample time to our current conference partners to plan and position themselves for impact for the impact that our move may have on their schools and communities. We've acted transparently, communicating our decisions as soon as we could appropriately do so, more than adhering to the Big 12's bylaws and agreements. Our disclosures last week provide the other Texas universities in the Big 12 four years to chart their own courses and maximize their respective outcomes with full knowledge of our move after the current agreement ends in 2025. Madam Chair, when I last appeared before your Senate Finance Committee in spring of 21, I laid out my budget priorities and I also shared our desire to attract top talent to our campus at every level while pursuing excellence in every manner. The decision by the University of Texas to accept an invitation to join the Southeastern Conference in 2025 enables us to continue this pursuit and to be best positioned for a stable and successful future in all of our athletic programs. We anticipate this move will positively impact every area of the university. Thank you for all your time today and all you do for the University of Texas and for the state of Texas. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. Uh, Senator Perry? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just need to kind of get a feel for how it works, and I really don't know because I haven't, I think I've set in on one trustee at Tech, but do you attend all the trustee meetings? Yes, sir. Does the chancellor attend? Yes, sir. Does the athletic director attend? Only if the issue pertains to athletics. Uh, is there board minutes? Is there a formal Robert Rule kind of thing? Do you keep minutes of all those meetings? I've seen minutes, uh, but it's it's done by the system, not by the campus. When, when were you first made aware of the conversations outside, inside, with members, with trustees, with other presidents of the SEC? When were you first uh, give, given an indication that you might be considering an SEC move or the trustees might? When was your first? Well, if I, if I can uh, maybe put it a little differently, when I got into the role, it was clear that conversations had regularly been occurring about the way college sports were heading. No, I, that's not the question. Specifically, related to the SEC move, when were you first made aware that that was a direction that UT was considering? Um, I, 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 with all due respect, I think the causality goes the other way. So I was part of discussions to determine that that was a direction we wanted to explore. It was not told that that was the direction I should explore by the board or another entity. Per so we're playing semantics. You're not an attorney, are you? No, sir. Good. As you'll quickly find out. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm trying to nail down when was the first contact by SEC to UT or UT to USC, SEC? When was that? Who was it? When and how long ago did people know? We reached out to the SEC, I don't recall the exact date, but it would have been 
the spring. Spring. So in spring, when you were in this chamber, this room, talking about finances and budget appropriations and all the things that we look at and do, there was an ongoing conversation or a beginning of a conversation about the potential for UT to move. Yes, we had spent time over the year considering the future of athletics enterprise and it unfolded uh, throughout the year. And, and you don't think that's a conflict with the bylaws that basically, do you don't view that as a negative to the conference, that conversation, and where the bylaw says in the event you have these communications, you have 12 hours to report that we're having these communications? Yeah, my reading again as a non-attorney of those bylaws says if a conference reaches out to us or induces us to move, then I have a duty to report that and to deny it. That's my reading of section 3.2 of the bylaws. Hairs. Splitting hairs in a big way. Well, you've heard my comments today. I'm not gonna reiterate them. Uh, I think we do have a vested interest in monitoring <clears throat> activities that impact us statewide. And arguably, you can't deny the fact that football and changes thereof, unfortunately, whether I agree or not, that we probably put way too much emphasis on it, but the fact that we do, that's the rules of the day, impacts us. And I think that, um, I said it earlier, there's gonna be some proposals in legislation that I'm sure you guys are not gonna find overwhelming, but you can't be the flagship. You can't carry the Texas name. And, and, and you know, if you're as big and great as you think you are, you should have made the Big 12 equal or better than the SEC and you didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I kind of feel sorry for the SEC. Cousin Eddie's coming home and he don't leave till he's wrecked, wrecked the whole house. And I don't quite think they understand where they think you're coming in at. I know where they think they're at. So that's a different topic. They made their bed, they'll lie in it. But I really think as a state, I'm very disappointed about how this has transpired. I'm as a legislature and a policy deal goes, I'm really disappointed that this wasn't even a conversation. And I understand proprietary stuff, but don't you think we might have should have known back in the spring? To our mind, we were transparent. We reached out as soon as we made a decision. Okay. And that's where we're here today. Thank you. Sarah Hughes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just thanks for being here. We all certainly recognize the importance of the University of Texas and the role you play and continue to play in Texas and in the country and even the world and the special responsibility you have to all of Texas. That's the state, not the university. And so to follow up on some of Senator Perry's questions, just so we can understand where we are and what's happened. And I think you've explained that you were in, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I think you said you were involved. Tell us when was the first communication between you or anyone with UT uh, and anyone with the SEC about the possibility of UT joining the SEC. Yeah, as I mentioned to the Senator, I don't know an exact date today, uh, but it would have been sometime in, I, I think in semester, so sometime in that spring semester. Right. And whatever those, and would you have been involved in that initial communication? Probably. I'd have to, I'd have to go back and double check if it was the very first point of contact or not. If you wanted to go back and check, how would you do that? Well, I'd see what I, if I have anything written down here, I may not, but if, if it was not done by me, it was in my direction. Okay. Would the initial contact have been phone call, email, personal conversation, oh, face-to-face -face conversation? I guess I should add Zoom to the list now, but <laughs> what was that like, that initial? Yeah, the first time I talked uh, to the commissioner, uh, <clears throat> I believe standing here today was a Zoom call. Commissioner of the SEC? Correct. Okay, and who else would have been involved in that conversation? Obviously you, the SEC commissioner, who else? Yeah, to standing here today, it, I can't remember if the, if the OU president was in that call or not, um, but for sure the commissioner and I were there, and I don't recall anybody else. And to make sure my questions are clear, and thank you for your answers, uh, when I talk about this conversation, we're gonna treat this as the <coughs> first communication between UT and SEC, is that is that fair? I, that's the way I took your question, sir. Very good, thank you. And so. Uh, who initiated that initial contact? Initial we contact. reached out as a university. Okay. Tell us about the substance of that conversation. Would y'all talk about, uh, tell us what you can remember about that conversation. Yeah, I remember that as, as just a question of, was this a path that it was even somewhat feasible? 
and, and well, we've, we heard that it was somewhat feasible. Okay. Since that initial conversation, tell us how the communications have evolved to get us to where we are today. Well, after that, there were follow-up conversations trying to decide um, if we wanted to pursue this <coughs> course of action or not. Um, and then ultimately arrived at the decision that uh, we did, had decided that the Big 12 past 2025 was not going to be our likely home. We were not going to extend the media rights. And then it was going through thinking about what's the next best thing for us. For those conversations, communications since that initial one, tell us who else was involved. As I assume it broadened in scope. Tell us who else was involved in those conversations. Well, see, see any here, but sure, between, between that yeah, sure. and where we are today. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't tell you who was in every exact conversation, but along the way, uh, Crystal Contra Athletic Director, our general counsel, uh, and at the appropriate times, the, the chair of the board was certainly informed about what we were doing, but not on that Zoom call, for example. Anybody else? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you today exactly who knew everything. Eventually, we started, as we got closer to worrying about disclosing that we were not going to um, extend our media rights, we started to talk about how we're going to communicate this appropriately and that kind of thing as well. When did you start worrying about disclosing you weren't going to extend your media rights? Well, it was, it was part of the whole journey of to get to the decision is, is this the right thing for the University of Texas? Are we comfortable uh, with that decision? And, you know, up until the, the moment when you hit send on something, you're always thinking, am I, am I really sure this is the best thing for the University of Texas at Austin? And so when was it you began, you became concerned about giving notice about extending your media rights? So let me back up. This question of what happens to the University of Texas in athletics is an ongoing conversation since I've been president. So there's no date I can tell you beyond when I, my first conversation with Greg Finn is over, here's where college sports is heading, what's this impact on UT, how do we think about it? Um, so somewhere along that journey, we started to think through, if we don't think the, the current media deal and the extension of that with the Big 12 is the right course, then we started to think about, well, how are we gonna get there from, from here to, to that change? But I honestly, sir, I can't tell you sitting here today what the date was when there was no epiphany moment. Oh, I understand, I appreciate your speaking in terms of semesters. So that initial conversation, spring semester, and here we are today, would you say that, not that epiphany, but reaching that consensus or reaching that concern, was that closer to the spring or closer to last week? We were on the path to, to not renew, as we told uh, the commissioner in a, in, a, in a call after the news story broke um, into the summer. So it became more and more, the path became more, more determined, but it was not a final decision until, until we got there. And we understand uh, you mentioned decision to accept an invitation to join the SEC. <clears throat> I know many of these are, are terms of art and there's a, there's a process there. When was it that in the UT camp, we decided this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna request the invitation. Tell us when was that and what that process was like? Yeah, well, it, again. I'm assuming that didn't happen just after the public, after you notified the public that you weren't gonna renew with the Big 12. Well, we, we is my assumption correct about that? I, I think, again, what I, what I would characterize it to today is we were on that path. And so it, we had a call as, as recently as the Sunday before we sent the letter to the Big 12 to listen to the commissioner and the executive committee and talk through how they saw... Commissioner of Big 12 or of SEC? Big 12. Okay, go ahead. Big 12 and the executive committee of the Big 12 to talk through what we were thinking and, and, and what was unfolding and, and to listen to what they had to say about the possibility of us actually remaining in the conference. So I went into that conversation in good faith, told them that we're on this path, that we're here to listen, and then ultimately it didn't change, change our course. Uh, what did you talk about? What might have changed your course uh, in the substance of that, going into that conversation in good faith, what were you looking for? What might have made it differently? What did the Big 12 say that you can share? This is, this is interesting to us. Yeah, I think, um, candidly, I think there was a little bit of a mismatch in the conversation where they wanted to hear a list of demands from us and we wanted to hear what they were thinking and neither side came into that conversation prepared to deliver what the other side was looking for. And 
Tell us generally when that conversation took place. Was that the Sunday before before the letters went out? So was that like the day before? Help me out. The letters go out on the day before the, the notice of the Big Twelve that we were not renewing the meeting rights. Got it. Okay. Okay. Now um, this question will be for all those communications, beginning with your initial one you remember during that spring semester. Uh, anybody affiliated with ESPN participate in any of those conversations? That one I can tell you categorically, absolutely no. Okay, and then laying aside those conversations we described about this path you were on, separate from that, how about communications between anyone at UT and anyone at ESPN on this topic, even close to this topic? Uh, to my knowledge and direction, absolutely zero conversations between us or any of our representatives in ESPN or any network. Any discussions uh, with ESPN about the future of college football playoff or ESPN's telecast rights or any of those things in, the, in these broad categories? No, sir. With nobody at UT? No, sir. And nobody at ESPN? No, sir. Okay. I'd also like to know about communications with OU, sort of along these same lines. When was the first time that, that you or anyone affiliated with UT and anyone affiliated with the OU had a conversation about this topic, about going to the SEC or leaving the Big 12? Yeah, I don't, I can't recall when the idea of what an eventual move or change might look like, but I talked to President Harris sometime in the fall. I was I was put in as permanent president uh, in September 23rd. It would have been after that time, but again, back to semesters would be the fall semester. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a conversation around, hey, where do you think sports is heading? How do you feel? A lot of the issues that, that we've seen come to fruition in the last several months um, with collegiate sports were things that were in sort of the tea leaves in the fall. So we started talking about it. And Senator that was, Hughes, before you ask another question, there half the lights on here are lit up. So yes, well, those questions down. Very good. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I will leave that. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I, uh, cool. President, thanks for that. And so, and, and fall and spring, I want to make sure I'm following you. So fall, that fall semester, meaning the one that would have been before the spring conversations we talked about with SEC. I'm yes, sir. not telling you, I'm asking you. Did I get that right? <laughs> fall, fall 2020. Very good. Okay. And so did those involve the discussion about OU and University of Texas going to the SEC? Uh, I can't recall when that topic came up, but I know we started talking about the future of college sports and our shared mutual concern over the way things were heading. Okay, what about communication specifically about UT and OU leaving the Big 12, going to the SEC? When's, when's the first communication like that that you're aware of? I, I honestly can't recall here today. It probably it was sometime between that fall semester and, the, and probably that first Sankey call. Mr. President, thank you. Madam Chair, thanks for your for your deference. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll yield. Thank you. I'll bet some of those other questions are gonna be asked anyway. Uh, Senator Whitmire, you were next. He forgot. See, he forgot. <laughs> no, I got. A, I got a question. I'm, I'm surprised my colleagues haven't asked you that. I've wondered for years. And you said that in your previous capacity as the uh, dean of business, you'd studied or y'all had reviewed the athletic funding. It's always been amazing to me when UT, which has such deep pockets and goes and buys coaches' contracts routinely. You've always explained, not you personally, but the institution has always explained, but that's our money. That's profits from our program. And I've always wondered why someone didn't say, but you use state facilities, your stadium, your employees, state employees, to make all these profits. So how do you feel that that is such an independent fund mm -hmm. from the oversight by the state legislature? Yeah, what, what thank you, you thank a, you. A couple hundred million, or I, I forget what I've read, how, yeah. the, the most profitable in the U.S., why wouldn't that be considered public monies? Yeah, thank you, Dean. The, so a couple of things in, in the way I think about it uh, is... Um, this was long before you got, sure. got there, but... Yeah, no, the, the part that I've seen is that the facilities that we build, the improvements we make, that is all out of athletics revenue. Sure. So a lot of the so-called profit on paper on an operating context is actually spent on capital expenditures to drive those those facilities. But the salaries, but the salaries that you that you uh, 
buyout as well. That's, that's all paid for by athletics, all the salaries of all the athletics, athletics department, mm -hmm. all that's self-sustaining. I, I don't think we've charged them a ground lease on the dirt, but they do send probably in the range of $15 million a year over to subsidize the academic enterprise. We're, we're very blessed as one, of the, as one of the few universities in the country where athletics subsidizes academics. Sure. Which is part of the whole calculus of how we got here today. But I don't think you've answered my question. Why, why is that money independent of state budgeting or oversight? I mean, everything y'all do over there is the University of uh, the State of Texas name, authorization, you're a state employee. Uh, y'all spend wildly some days, some would say, successfully, I might add. But I've always wondered why you felt like that was so your money and not the public's money. I, I, I don't know. I, again, I'm, I'm new to the role, so maybe no. my views no, change over time. But I very much view it as in the states and the university's interests. And so when we talked back to the question about the board, the board has oversight over all those projects just like they do over an academic yeah. building. So all that flows through. That's part, part of the Obviously, normal governance structure. The board approves it, but... The state has no control. If you want to go buy out somebody's $20 million contract, why not? You do it, and you always spend it that it's not taxpayer money, it's university profits, which I've always wondered why you didn't view it and really why there's not more pushback by my colleagues. Yeah, but you're using state properties, you're using state brand name, you're using state employees. We're not going to fix that tonight, but uh, it's just amazing me how in the context of sports revenue and expenditures that nobody ever asks you, why do you think that's your money instead of the, yeah. the public's? In closing, uh, for someone who likes transparency, I think it's essential. I do want to kind of compliment you on being able to keep whatever transaction that my attorney friends down here are drilling you about in a building that you can't keep a secret. <laughs> it's a hell of a deal that an Admiral McRaven would be proud of you <laughs> because you pulled it off like a special ops program. I mean, it's amazing that I just wonder quite often, did you even tell your wives? <laughs> well, the one thing I will say on the, uh, back to your former point, you know, you know Chairman Eltife, and the yeah. chairman does not view that as money that he does not care about. Uh, when we went through the coaching coaches hiring this year, oh. he's laser focused as is, as is the board on those are not free re resources in the way we think about it. So I just want to put if you have fears of that, I want to no, put this to rest. You take the money seriously. You've spun it as long as anyone alive can can recall. But uh, we're talking about vast amounts of money that you make with a state product, and as long as anyone can recall, you've always said no, we don't have to answer questions about that because that's money we've made from our hard work and, and success. And uh, I was just curious if y'all had ever discussed that internally as yeah. to if we're ever gonna get questioned about that, we better have a better answer than probably you've given me today. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I I would tell you, in my year or so in the seat, I take that investment decision, those investment decisions very seriously, just as I took this decision. Good. Thank you. Senator uh, Birdwell. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I'm gonna, cannot match Senator Hughes in the lawyerly digging, but I'm gonna get the spade out here for a moment, do a little more digging. Was your contact, the University of Texas system is not the Big 12. The University of Texas at Austin is. Mm -hmm. Was your contact with the SAC directly to you? Or were you directed to contact the SEC in reply to a contact that the SEC had made to the system? It was in my direction. I chose to reach out to the SEC. Did the SEC contact you seeking your response or were you directed to contact the SEC 
as you just said you reached out to them neither so let me be clear they neither reached out nor was i directed to reach out i reached out of my own accord is that straightforward enough well it, it it is straightforward enough that causes me great concern with the the direction that senator perry and senator hughes have taken this was your decision subject to board of region approval the ultimate contract signed on friday yes was subject to board of regents approval which we went through on that friday when you made contact with the sec did you notify the chancellor no, I don't think I did at that time. Do you know if the chancellor notified Senator Eltai for former Senator Eltai for any of the board members? I don't know who talked to him at what moment around that call. With the ramifications related to the impacts to the other universities in the state, did you give any thought or consideration to notifying any members of the legislature of the Senate committees of oversight or the senators from or the representatives from the respective uh, locales that were going to be deleteriously affected? It, I can't think of all the possible communications I discarded. We talked about who needs to know what's the right conversation to have, and here we are today. Did you think to contact or did you make contact with the lieutenant governor to notify him of the pending decision that was coming? I had not spoken to the lieutenant governor about this matter. I, uh, we've had testimony from the from the commissioner that the commissioner of the big 12 that says that there was no such request for extension of media rights um, my constituent school Baylor says no such contact was made you mentioned that you sent a letter to the big 12 saying that you would depart what prompted that letter anything from the big 12 or solely your contact with the sec so let me try to break the two decisions conceptually one decision are we satisfied and happy with the status quo is that in the best interest of the university and status quo would mean riding along the big 12 expecting and planning to continue our media right grants and looking for the next negotiated deal as part of that uh, so what so what you're telling me is you didn't get a letter from the big 12 saying please extend your media rights you didn't get such a letter no it'd be two two different things i can think that maybe you may be thinking of or have no parts about that i'm gonna make sure i'm clear part one is it is true to my understanding i was not in the seat that in 2018 ut and ou both declined to extend our media rights at that point in time um, and that I think was covered by the press and known broadly. Um, second part that I was around were conversations, but not a formal letter, but conversations that if we're going to preemptively renegotiate our media rights deals, we all understand that part of the thing that's gonna be required is that of, in that negotiation is to extend our media rights. Because no, whoever that partner might be is not gonna sit down and want to go through that negotiation if the horizon is only 2025 as far as it okay then let me then let me try to clear this up for you because look at, at, I'm just as an old military guy there's three decisions what to decide when to decide it and when to announce it and I'm not getting a satisfactory answer to any of those three questions right now you mentioned reading tea leaves I just I'm just going to say it flat out, okay, because I'm, I'm very much where Senator Perry is. Reading tea leaves, and you talk about your relationship with the SEC, your relationship with the legislature broadly, and I'll speak for me directly, is deteriorating as we speak. I think you need to worry about that relationship because the Board of Regents is nominated by the governor, confirmed by the Senate because the Board of Regents, while 80 to 85% of their decisions, and like you said, your job is to think what's best for the university, but it's gotta be inside the box that the Regents set for you. And why is that? Not just because you're a member of the system, but because the Regents are there 
to impose the will of the people of Texas on the university's system, not validate the will of the system or individual universities onto the people of Texas. The regents are stewards of the system on behalf of the people of Texas, not stewards of each university on behalf of the system, regardless of what the people of Texas think. That is the seminal relationship that the fact that you're here tells you that there's serious concern with that relationship and the damage that has been done here. Now, I'm like Senator Colcourst. We're gonna come out of this. Baylor's gonna do great stuff under Dr. Livingstone's leadership. What that's gonna look like, I don't know. You know, it's always darkest before the dawn. But this is the third major decision that appears to me as a legislator that is timed to avoid the legislature in its legislative session where it is structured with the power to make decisions that when we're not in the regular session, you're gonna have 18 months to make this thing happen before any of us are gathered to be able to do anything about it in January of 23. This seems timed to avoid the legislature. And this is the third one. University of Texas at Houston, the statues, Senator Creighton, and now this one. Um, I know, Mr. President, you've only been in a seat a year, but you've got a lot of trust, I think, at least with Senate District 22, you've got a lot of trust to, to regain because you've lost quite a bit. The system has lost quite a bit. In my view, the nature of the questions you're getting ought to tell you that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Springer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you, you mentioned in there that you saw an opportunity, you know, that uh, because you've been blessed to, to see positive cash flow generation coming through here, and you see more going forward. What What's the financial projection um, for going to the SEC for UT? Uh, I, honestly, sir, I don't think we know exactly yet. Um, range? I mean, the, the reported numbers that we can all uh, point to have been in the range of, from, this is from media only, and this is after their New Deal kicks in, it would be in the 60 plus million dollar range from the from the TV and media deal the SEC would have. So and, and 40 million year, years, year. years and I'm sorry, I'm, I was gonna say years from now. So that's not today's dollars. Those are future dollars that about the time we would be entering. Okay. so. And today you get how much from Big 12 for media dollars? Yeah. It's, 24, it's, I think I heard him say. Yeah, 24 plus some other distributions. Um, and then plus we currently have the Longhorn Network. So $30 so call million it, dollars a year plus you're going to lose $15 million on the Longhorn Network. So you're going to net 15? Yeah, it's, it's really, honestly, sir, it's hard to tell because the, the question is, at hand is, what does the SEC look like in 2025 versus what does the Big 12 look like in 2025? So the decision process is not today's Big 12 deal against the SEC deal. It's where's the Big 12 going to be? And we feel like the SEC has more security, more stability to be in a better spot in 2025 than the Big 12 does. And, and that's why I'm asking for just the projection. I, I don't even think you have to be working on your MBA to sort of come up to a model that says, you know, what, what's my financial picture look like for this business enterprise? And I guess I'm trying to get to that. And it's hard to think that the decision's made when somebody can't say, here's what the dollars are. Sure, no, but I, nobody's sitting here today, and I think President Bushini may have said, or Chancellor Bushini, nobody here today knows what the Big 12 outcome is gonna look like in 2025. Now, we, you can sit there and say, what if it's flat, hypothetically? If it's flat and it stays and our cash flows would stay in the 40s, um, then maybe, as you said, it's a $15 million increment. But we don't know what that cash flow is going to be look like from the Big Twelve in twenty twenty five. None of us do. So, so I, you know, it, it's it's what I used to teach: it's forecast of cash flows, mm -hmm. right? So, you, but, but I just want to be clear with you: it's a and forecast. that's why I'm asking what the forecast of the cash flow is. Yeah, I mean, it's so. you can put your own point on it. My, to me, flat would be a win, and it for might the been, Big Twelve. For the Big Twelve, it might have been less than that. But it's really hard to tell knowing what's going on with households and cable and all those other issues. And, and looking at the, I mean, did you think that Perryman report seemed reasonable for the effects on the cities? Uh, probably not. Uh, there are a couple of things I thought, but were 
uh, weaknesses in it, but I, it's hard to tell from what he discloses the full scope and nature of the report, how he exactly did it. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, and I just picked um, from the Lubbock standpoint was a like 160 million plus. And, and I guess, you know, as a state institution, you know, if, if another state institution made an effect that was going to affect the city of Austin for $160 million or, and especially UT for $20 million a year, do you think that it would be reasonable to sort of have a conversation with those in leadership to, to let them know that that's what was going to happen possibly? Well, I, we got here today and as I've articulated, we've all got four years to try to do the best we can. And I think these are great schools that have bright futures. And I think they're going to end up in a place to me much better than what Perry member rejects. I should also point out, sir, that... I mean, but you, you would feel safe to say that it's going to be negative. I, I, I think the expectation will be negative. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that would be, I, that would be here if we were all thought this is positive. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, if they thought that they were going to make more money by you guys leaving it, I don't think we probably would be having this meeting. I agree. Um, you know, if it was, you know, you know, if it was Vanderbilt leaving the SEC, as I look at sort of the numbers, the 16 schools that are in there, they're the, they're the least profitable, least, you know, dollar wise driving revenue um, type of deal. And assuming if they left, nobody in the SEC would really care. I, they thought they could fill them up with somebody else. And I, that's not right. I apologize. That's more of a comment than, than a question on that. But um, um, on, on the Longhorn Network, so is it going to be just dissolved? We have that. The expectation is we'll wind it down, but we haven't talked specifically about what that will look like. Because there was a there was a report out that had something in there that ESPN was going to do a buyout to UT on the Longhorn Network yeah. to the tune of maybe 160 million, and that UT was going to pay the University of Oklahoma's exit fee to the Big 12. Yeah, and, and I guess if that's the case, that's an asset that the state of Texas has created. And if we're going to give $75 million to the state of Oklahoma to pay an exit fee, I've got a really big problem. So are you, can yeah. you say committing that you're not going to pay <laughs> I, use exit I can commit. Uh, I probably should admit this in front of this body. I, I grew up in Oklahoma, but I'm not going to pay their exit fee. Uh, so let me be clear. I was born in Oklahoma, and I don't you want you to pay their yeah. exit fee. Now, let me be clear. Uh, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know where that came from, honestly. If you think about those cash flows that are, that are in that deal from ESPN, those are in exchange for our, our tier three media rights. Correct. What would make them write a lump sum check for something they never receive? There's no there's no obligation for them to send us a check whether they have or don't have the right to to broadcast our games. So it's it's a it's a ludicrous report, honestly. Well, I, you know, I think you could possibly make an argument that that they they see the value of y'all being at SEC and the Big Twelve possibly use leveraging y'all to collapse it that they make more money and they could possibly make a. Yeah. 500 million to a billion dollars more if the Big 12 ceases to exist and they have four power conferences. So uh, corporations can do their form yeah. of cash flow projections and sure. what's more in their interest. And that's why I asked early on today to the commissioner of the Big 12 was how much is ESPN as a corporation playing and manipulating what is happening in our uh, schools at, uh, athletic programs. Yes, sir. I, I understand the concern. Let's be clear. Not happened. Not going to happen. Okay. Don't thank know where you. it came from. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Senator Taylor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Arzel, it's good to see you. Um, I think I've kind of got an idea of somewhat of your answer of what I was going to ask was why did you feel like the Big 12 was not going to be a viable option after 2025? Does that have to do with the streaming versus cable or yeah, I, honestly, Senator, I think if you look at the comparison of the, the option that we ended up having at, at, on the table from the SEC, it offers more stability. And think about all the things that's come up here today. Uh, we want to recruit great student athletes. Uh, we want to put them in a position to succeed. We want to maintain a healthy athletic program that provides net benefits to our academic side. And the world is changing and has a lot of uncertainty and turbulence in it. And when that happens, you have to come thinking about what's the position of strength in that. And in our view, at the end of the day, the SEC had a greater position of strength than the Big 12. And what was the weakness in the Big 12? I mean, what was not working for you right now? Well, I, I, I don't think there was necessarily any, any one thing, and that's partly why that conversation I, I pointed to was, was a hard conversation, because there's nothing easy to say this would solve something. Uh, but if you look at the landscape, and it, a lot of this came up earlier, you know, the young people today want to play against the very best talent they can play against. And if you look at where 
uh, whether it's high school recruits or where the NFL is recruiting from, the SEC has more market share there than the Big 12 does. Um, if you look at uh, what gets people excited to want to go to a home game, much in the way that, that, that people are talking today about concerns about if we're not coming to a particular town every other year that has an impact, um, if we're able to draw more marquee games to our stadiums, that has a positive impact for us. So it's, it's, this, it's the flip side of many of the same things you've heard today just from a side of how are we thinking about how to protect what we do and make sure it stays strong and healthy and relevant. So I heard you talk about the, the difference in numbers. I get the big thing. I mean, was there anything wrong with UT Athletics? You were, were you having a problem with the Big 12 or that you were doing like your student athletes were being? You didn't have a problem getting people to come play at UT. No, I mean, we always, you know, like to be even more successful, but uh, we won the Director's Cup this year, so we had a heck of a year. So this is not about... That was while you are in the Big 12. Correct. Yes, sir. So we had a great year. So this is not about this moment in time and where we stand today. That's why I'm still trying to get my hands right. You reached out to SEC because you felt like it, Big 12 was not going to be able to make it in 2025, and I'm trying... You haven't given me a specific of why you didn't think the Big 12 was going to make it after 2025. Yeah, Senator, let me be very clear. I don't want you to think that what I'm saying is we didn't think the Big 12 would make it. Well, that's but, what I'm hearing. Why would I, I know, you reach out the SEC? You said yourself, you didn't think it was going to stay the same, it was going to get flat. Why was that? And well, if you as a part of that, why would sure. you make a difference to make sure that didn't happen? Sure. Yes, sir. Um, so let me be clear again. In fact, let me go beyond that. Sure. You were having discussions about expanding the playoffs to more teams. Why you were having these discussions with the SEC? Why would you do that? What do you mean by, why would I do what? Well, you're talking about expanding the playoffs. I, so I was not part, but the Big 12 was, sure. UT was. And that's... Was your athletic director involved? In oh, I, I'd have to look back and see what committee he was on. He might have been on a committee. Yeah, but that's... I'm just trying to find out sure. what was the problem with the Big 12 that you felt like you needed to reach out to SEC and break 99 deal agreements and all that. I, I, I appreciate the four-year notice that you're going to break the 99-year deal, but... Uh, I'm just trying to find out what, what was the real genesis of this whole process. Yeah, so if you think about these agreements come up every so often, right? right? The media. And the media agreements. Right. So and who those, runs college football now? The media? Oh, uh, is, is the question I mean, who runs? I'm I mean, just I, asking who actually runs? Who's making the decision now in college football? Well, I, maybe this comes back to our, our uh, whether we think too little or too much of ourselves, but I think we have a say in what we do. I still think the universities have have uh, have agency over those decisions. So far, the only difference I've heard between the SEC and Big 12 is about $15 million. That's all you've been able to enumerate for us today, and, that, and that's an estimate. Yes, sir. You're Let telling me, me you're doing all of this for $15 million. No, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not being clear. So let me back up. These media rights agreements are long-lasting. So when they expire... Schools have an opportunity to decide, do they want to move or not move? And that decision is not present at other points in time. So as 2025 approaches, the University of Texas has a chance to reconsider, is this the best home for the University of Texas? And that's the chance that is around that window of time that if we re renew our grant for 15 more years, hypothetically, that we don't have that decision again. So I'm doing the best I possibly can to forecast where's the world heading, what's the best spot for the University of Texas at Austin, given the way the world's heading, knowing that 2025 is a potential move date, and I'm assessing the landscape of college sports. And in my view, the SEC was a more stable, strong home for UT Austin starting in 2025 than the Big 12. That, that's all I'm trying to say. So you're saying... You felt like the Big 12 was going to fail, even with OU and Texas still in it in 2025. No, sir. Let me be unequivocal on that. I, and I'm not at all saying I thought it would fail. I'm so not saying it was state. doomed. I'm not saying it was going away. None of that. All I'm saying is for us, starting in 2025, in my view, based on everything going on today and all the uncertainty and risk and exposure out there, the best home for us was the SEC starting in 2025. I, I, I want to be clear, Senator. I'm not trying to say any anything gloomy and doomy about the Big 12 at all. Just for us, the stronger outcome, the more positive outcome, the safer outcome was the SEC starting then. And what is a, in your view, what is a stronger, more positive outcome? 
Well, one thing just very quickly is less, less downside risk, less uncertainty. So I felt like that conference was well positioned to weather the storms facing college athletics. All these things we're talking about today, they have uh, are in a good position to go through that turbulence, to face what's coming and to make good decisions to go forward. And I don't, and I don't mean that as any disparagement that the Big 12 can't. I just sense more risk and uncertainty over those same issues in the way they'll impact the Big 12 than I see in the way they'll impact the SEC. So you've been here all day and you heard our discussion earlier about long range, where is this heading for college sports in general and viewership and all that. If you end up with, for example, it's been discussed, the SEC just being like the super conference and nobody else. They take, and it, do you see potential viewership problems down the road if there's only a certain number of schools involved in real comp competition and then everybody else is in a whole nother league? I, I, I worry as a fan about competitiveness. Um, and I heard uh, Senator Cole Course you know, there are great things about college sports where Abilene Christian gets to play and beat Texas, which I was otherwise really bitter about, but that's a great story, right? That's something really cool about college sports. So my hope is whatever unfolds is that those kinds of things are protected because I think that's a neat thing that we get to do. All that said, I know that every individual university is trying to win every Saturday or every Monday, which depends on pick your favorite sport, they're trying to win all those games. So we're trying to be the best we can possibly be, but as a fan, as a consumer of that entertainment market, it's better if it's competitive. So oh. that's that's sort of this weird economic situation we're in. Everybody wants sort of consolidated power that they hold, but at the same time, having a more even landscape and competitive games is good for the fans. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Madam Chairman, I'm just trying try one more time. So what in this changing environment made you feel like SEC had the advantage over the, that the Big 12 was not gonna be a stable place to be? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, so I'm not trying to be obstinate. I think there's no one factor I can point to and say, this is the thing that made me wake up one time and decide that's it, I think this is a better outcome. But if you lay all the forces acting on collegiate sports right now, all the uncertainty of what, how they full, unfold, and they speak to the idea that being, that, that playing from a position of strength, from a position of brand, from a position where um, you know, you've got a better chance to attract fans, to, to have a big platform. All those things are heading that direction. And in my mind, standing here today, trying to forecast 2025, that's the SEC is in a stronger position to withstand those things than the Big 12. And, and honestly, quite candidly, if, if other people didn't think that's the same way, then we probably back to Senator Springer's comment, we probably wouldn't be having these kind of tough conversations today. Well, I understand the University of Texas is, if not number one, is one of the top universities for revenue from sports. So I would think you'd be strong enough to handle whatever kind of, you'd be the last man standing, so to speak, in a changing environment. Uh, with all the image and likeness we've talked about that we passed this past session, I thought that would be more of an advantage to your institution than anybody else. I mean, I see all these things happening. You're talking about changes. To me, they were more consolidating power with a few large institutions, and, and you're one of those. Yes, sir. And now you're no. leaving your other Texas partners to go join another league. I just, I don't know, I haven't gotten a clear reason why you think UT, as big as they are, is better joining another big conference rather than being the one we have. It's obviously very competitive. Right. We have contenders in every sport. No, I, and, and I, the Big 12. And, I'm, and I, I'm sorry if I'm not being articulate enough. And I, so, so think about it as we've got to attract great student athletes and they want to play against the very best competition on a big platform, on a big stage. In many sports, not all and not all across the board, the SEC has the biggest stage. So you think this gives you a recruiting advantage in Texas? That's, that's one small part. So, so go there, think about the fact that our fans want to watch great games on Saturdays. And we have many great Big 12 games on Saturdays, um, but there are more opportunities for some of those marquee games um, in that conference based on historical viewership and trends. Then we talked about media and those. And those issues. So again, sir, there's no one even slice of it where I could say it was all driven by this one set of factors. It's you got, you got to take into consideration, I, at least in my mind, the full landscape of where things are heading. And there's a bunch of, a bunch of things that are all, you know, pointing in this direction of it's a time of a lot of uncertainty. It's time of time of change. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Hinojosa. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
I, I just have a couple of questions. I, I know sometimes um, it's difficult to deal with reality and facts. Uh, and obviously, uh, UT made certain projections in terms of future income. Uh, and from the projections that I've seen, uh, show that um, the SEC is projected to start distributing about 67 million per year uh, per member. Uh, and uh, big, um, the Big 12 was projected, was projected to pay its members about 40 million. So the, the financial aspects of, of um, I guess, uh, TV uh, viewing and uh, ESPN, uh, they were a big factor in making a decision for UT to make a change. Uh, the, the, the idea of eventual media rights revenue is, is, is material. It's not, it's not like it's a zero thing in the whole decision making. And I mentioned before, uncertainty over what the eventual media rights deal the Big 12 would, would gather or garner is, is uncertainty that I, I felt was real and was a serious source of, of financial risk. So, but again, just to be clear, sir, I, I standing here today, we don't know what the Big 12 number is in 2025 or 26. So if it's 40 and plus our ESPN revenue, there's probably an incremental bump based on today's dollars. But the decision has to be thinking about what's the world look like in 2026 and beyond. Well, then uh, it seems to me that if money was not the deciding factor, then you probably should have stayed with the Big 12. It, again, sir, I'm, let me be clear. Money, the, 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 we need the economic resource base to continue to have a world-class athletic department that also subsidizes our academic enterprise. And so I can't sit in the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a finance professor by training, I can't sit in the end of the day and say the money's not important. The money does matter, it's part of the whole thing. But it's not the only thing we looked at to say, two media rights deals side by side, which you want to move conferences or not. I don't, I don't, I don't want anybody to reach that conclusion that it was looking at today's Big 12 media rights versus reported for forecasted SEC media rights, therefore now we should go one way or another. It's, it, it's a much more complicated decision than that. Well, I know it's complicated and I can be privy to your thoughts and your process, mind processes to get to this decision. Uh, but you're contradicting everything else and research being done in terms of projections of income, revenue income, on the changing landscape in terms of uh, TV rights. I'm sorry, which, which way do you think I'm contradicting the, the, the way that, what? Well, what's, what's, what's my, what tell me, I'm, I'm, I'm in all, with all well, respect, what, what's my contradiction? Oh, well, the contradiction is, then why did you leave uh, the Big 12 if it's not for money? I, not sorry, for I, 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 I'm gonna be clear again. I'm not saying it's not for money. I'm not saying money was not a factor. I'm saying that was only one piece of the equation. And the media rights thing you're, at, you're, you're asking about very narrowly is only one part of the overall economic set of factors to make a decision. So there's there, the economic levers that are pulled in a college ath, uh, athletic program are more multifaceted than just the media rights deal. Does that help? Well, let me rephrase it. Uh, was the uh, money part, the economic issue, was that the deciding factor? Sir, I, I, and, I, and I'm trying not to be argumentative. There's, I can't tell you here today, this is the, it wasn't like I piled things up and said, well, now this is the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, and now I'm over this hump and now I'm decided. We've talked through all these same factors and, and the economic engine that drives college sports is one of those things we talked through. But it's also, uh, you know, brand, the ability to attract better student athletes, the, the, the ability to excite our alumni. When I go out and meet alumni, if we can argue whether it should or shouldn't be true, but if athletics is going well, they're happier. Well, experience has shown that uh, television contracts are the driving force to the realignment taking place uh, throughout the nation in the different football conferences. You know, Sir, I, you know, I, I, can, I can tell you uh, it's, a, it's a factor. Um, I wouldn't say it was not important, but I wouldn't say it was a deciding factor. The fact that we had a window of time where that deal expired led to the timing of where we are today. But again, think about just magnitudes. We receive more revenue from the home games than we do from the media deal. So I don't, I don't want you to think um, you know, that, that the sole driver of our economic fortune is the TV rights deal. So you would not object to um, staying in the Big 12 conference and uh, helping out, subsidizing, if you want to call that, 
Uh, are there other universities that are in the Big 12? No. I'm not sure about that. So we've made the decision that we want to leave in 2025, which I think indicates my interest in remaining and subsidizing. I, okay, maybe I didn't say the question correctly. Uh, you have no, you would not object then to staying in the Big 12 uh, and on the, just an the income projections, I'm not making as much money as you project you would make with the SEC? Um, there might be some set of factors one can imagine where I would decide that the Big 12 is worth staying. But I didn't go in, I didn't put the, put a dollar price on kind of the Big 12 equivalent it would take to get me to stay or to move. Well, one last question and uh, comment. It would seem to me that uh, if you are the president of the University of Texas, uh, your main obligation, responsibility, will be to the university. Uh, and to me, it seems very clear that money, income, revenue has to be the deciding factor uh, because your commitment, responsibility is to UT, not to help out other universities. I mean, let me help you, Senator, or just help me anyway. The, the difference in the two ways you framed it are, is, to me, very important. The first time you asked me, you said the deciding factor, and just now you said A. So I'm with you if you say it's a deciding factor, it's one of the set of things we worry about, I'm with you. If you said it's the, I don't wanna stand here today and tell you that was the thing that I looked at to reach my decision as if it was the thing that tipped it all over. Does that make sense? Well, we could use semantics all night. It could be the majority reason. Or, or, right, or and it's not a math problem, right? It's not like I can tell you 51% of my decision was driven by something, <laughs> right? I mean, we just can't, I, I don't know how to tell you that, sir. Thank you, sir. Senator Whitmer. <clears throat> Let me see if I can help you, Jay. We've heard all afternoon these other communities say they're going to miss the big brand name coming in every other year. That's what this gentleman is trying to say and has said they have the opportunity to be in a different league with I think any reasonable person would say has bigger names, Alabama, and I could go through the list. They want to take advantage of the opportunity to be in a conference where every other year, Alabama will be out here, Auburn will be out here, LSU will be out here. The same feelings and motivation from the other three smaller communities feel about towards them. And then Senator Hinojosa, living in Houston, maybe Senator Creighton and others and I from that area know what a hotbed of recruiting it is. UT is losing, as well as our friends in the Big 12, to the SEC because they're on higher profile TV and to compete with A&M and other S the, the other SEC school in Texas, they're not competing at the level they'd like on recruiting. And, and one thing I would say to everyone, where was everyone's passion when A&M picked up and left without asking the legislature? What the hell's going on here that A&M did exactly what UT's doing? We didn't have a hearing. We didn't hear the outcry from the communities. Yeah, it is a different situation, and I understand. I respect the, and I, and I fussed at UT publicly about buying their 300 acres after the legislature adjourned. So I understand the timing would get anyone's attention, but the motivation is not just financial. It's, it's the, what their base wants them to do. This gentleman is just a hired, he, he's an employee, answers to the chancellor, the regents, and they all answer to the people that fill their stadium. So in closing, it's not much of a question other than we've spent six hours on this and my phone is ringing because parents are scared to death of school starting without any clear indication about mask in public school. And Ben Tom and LBJ School in Houston has a 24 hour waiting period for anyone wanting to see an emergency doctor. So maybe we ought to need, need to all question our priorities. Senator Culpers. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. President, um, just a couple of questions um, that I took a few notes here. You made the quote, where is, where is the world heading? That was your question. Where is the world heading? And I, I, I do think that that's been a subject of some of our conversation today. And so I would ask you, if the world is headed to just one mega conference, what does that do for the Texas athlete? What does that do for the high school athlete in Texas and their parents? Yeah, I, Senator, and I, and I don't have, just to be clear, I don't have any deep insight beyond, you know, Commissioner Bowles, we've been doing this longer than I have, so I, I don't want to purport that I'm the most insightful into where the world is heading in terms of that possibility of going to the, the one big conference. I think there, and this is, I think, a little bit the spirit of your earlier questions, I think there's a short-run question and a long-run question. In the short-run question, one might think that members of that big, prestigious, powerful conference are better off because they have the exposure, they're competing with the, the biggest opponents and all those other things we've been talking about. But one can imagine in the long run, if that leads to less enthusiasm and excitement over college sports, for the reasons you, I think, articulated in your earlier comments, then I think there's a long run question about whether that's best. Um, so I, I, in my mind, I would separate out sort of short-term effects versus potential long-term effects. So I, I know I heard different numbers from all the universities, but what's your athletic budget? It's over 200 million. It's probably 220, 225 in that range. Where does that put you in the U.S.? Uh, depending on the, how you count, probably first. And that's without a winning football team of late. It's in, in spite of our, in spite of our football team. We, we've been winning, just not like we like to win. Three and seven against the Horn Frogs. Um, <laughs> so um, maybe your fan base would rather lose to Alabama than TCU. So. Um, having said that, is that I, I really, I really want to ask this question because this is about every kid. I think one of the ADs said we have eight hundred, eight hundred thousand high school. That couldn't be right, but I think it could be eight hundred thousand high school athletes because we have five million students. 800,000 high school athletes, 400 in Division I schools. I mean, that's just incredible. And I can tell you as a former athlete, I, all I wanted to do was play college golf. I didn't want to be a pro athlete. I thought maybe I could, but I didn't have the guts to try when time was to do it because I was poor, didn't have money to go out on the tour. But it, it begs to ask this question, are we saying that a three-star athlete that doesn't get looked at this mega conference or power conference mm -hmm. doesn't have worth? And, and, and I, I know that that is going to be a rhetorical question, but it needs to churn. It needs to churn in our bellies, in our hearts, in our minds. It needs to be looked at in an antitrust way. It really does because we are gonna have the haves and have nots. So I, I was bothered by a statement that the commissioner made because I looked at the 12 teams, there's gonna be 12 teams that make the playoffs. I mean, I, I, I watched the year that Baylor and TCU, they, they, should have been, they should have been in the four the first year in 2014. Mm -hmm. Ohio State, because they had a playoff game and won 50, by 50 points, I believe, jumped mm -hmm. TCU into the four, went on to win the national championship and TCU went on to beat Ole Miss 42-3 to in the Peach Bowl. So who was the best team that year, right? Mm -hmm. But the question is that the commissioner said, now there's talk about, as, as you know, the media says today, Clemson and, and um, uh, Florida State have reached out to the SEC. Let's just go to four. Y'all are going to have your little pods and come up with our four and we move on. Is that good for college athletics? Or is 12 teams good for college athletics? Is March Madness good for both women's and um, men's athletics? Is the College World Series good? Is yeah, I, it? I mean, I, if you're asking my, my opinion, I think having 
a wider set. That's why, I mean, if you give me a choice between a 14 playoff and 12, I'll take 12 for all the reasons you espoused. Mm -hmm. I like having a broader net to cast more opportunities for people to, to try to compete. And football's always been one of those awkward sports where, you know, it goes back to the old UPI and AP polls declaring the champions, which doesn't feel very satisfactory. So we're on a, on a, on a progress toward something that feels more like a meritocracy um, where more ch more teams will have a chance under that format to compete, which I think is I think is a good thing. Now, should we stop at 12 and all that kind of stuff? I, I, I don't know. But I can tell you from my opinion, going from four to 12 is a good idea. Yeah, well, I, um, I appreciate your candor. I know there's been some semantics with the lawyers here today, and, and I think that transparency is good, and there's merit, uh, what Senator Whitmire said about, I think when, when Texas A&M left, it didn't crater a conference. Um, it didn't. In fact, at the time, I don't think A&M was probably the marquee team in the conference. Mm -hmm. And actually, when A&M left, another Texas team was added. So we actually went from four teams in a power conference to five at that time. So it was a bonus to the state of Texas at that time. We can argue that, but that's what happens. I mean, the numbers are the numbers. And there was maybe an opportunity for others to enter in. I'm always confused about today, you know, who was for U of H getting in or, or other teams and who wasn't, and I'm not sure we got to the bottom of that. But going from five com power conference schools to two is not good for the state of Texas. And ultimately, we love our fans, we love our donors, we love our alumni, but the bottom line is it's not good for the 800,000 Texas high school athletes. That's the bottom line. And so I think that the, the, the question here is that you and OU leaving as two anchor tenants of this, you're, you're into mall. cash flow. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're into cash flow yeah. into a mall when there's other great businesses there, um, you know, could, could change the tectonic plates, as you say, they're shifting. I have absolute faith that this state arguably the richest state with high school athletes, produces day in and day out the best athletes, will not go from five power conference schools and leading the nation, only about, and ahead of California at four, North Carolina at four, and Florida at three, to descend to two. I have that faith, and I know that we're gonna find our path forward, but I appreciate your candor today and uh, I want to, to say to the nation, wake up. Consolidation is not always good, and there's lots of federal laws out there that prevent that from happening. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Chairman Burroughs. Thank you. Um, appreciate you being here today. I do have a few questions for you. Um, I wanna go back to, I know you spent a lot of time with Senator Hughes talking about kind of that spring reach out to the SEC. But if I believe kind of going into the chronology, you had kind of come to the decision in the fall of 2020 that the Big 12 was really not the path forward, not viable, at least in your own mind. Is that about the right time for that? I, I, I want to be clear. Uh, let me make, be careful. So I'm, come to the decision is too strong, right? Become concerned, want to explore further, want to see what else is possible. Again, I, you're, 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 I, the way I take your question is you decided something in the fall and that's too strong. Okay. You, you got pretty comfortable with the idea sometime in the fall of 2020 that the Big 12 may likely not be the future for the University of Texas. I got comfortable with the idea. I wanted to know what our options look like. And, and you said, I think the words was because you felt the Big 12 was unstable and not safe. I think I would say that I was concerned about the way things were heading and I was concerned about the risk and uncertainty in, in the, for the future of where we were. And I thought there might be a place that had less risk and more certainty. Okay, but we, I would go back and look. I think you said unstable That's, and okay. not safe. I, I'm not arguing. Okay. I'm really trying to, and I think you've been asked this a couple of times, so I just want to try to really see if I can understand, what was unstable and unsafe at the Big 12 back in the fall of 2020? I mean, you've got, we saw this, this point in time, we didn't know it then, but Baylor was going to be the national championships in you know, college basketball. Oklahoma has the number one recruiting cast for football in the entire country. Lots of success. What was unstable and unsafe about the Big 12 in the fall of 2020 that led you to kind of think this way? Yeah, let me, let me try to be more careful now. If, if I, and I'm not, you probably quoted me entirely accurately, so let me just try to make sure I'm, I'm more clear today, this moment. So um, again, I don't wanna disparage what I thought of the Big 12. At the end of the day, these are all comparisons of choices. And you're left thinking, 
where do I think the world's going to be in 2025 and beyond? And do I feel like where we stood in the Big 12, forecasting out what that might look like, that that was the best place for the University of Texas at Austin? And so to get there, I got to a point where I thought there might be better opportunities out there and I should explore those as a fiduciary to my university. And then we went down the road of exploring those options. Okay, so did you, did you sit there and say, well, maybe we look at what the SEC has built over there and perhaps because some poor choices uh, the Big 12 has made, we could maybe fix those and in you know, four or five years, we could be equally as stable. After all, we're Texas. We've got the best high school athletes, all the resources of the world. Did you think about the potential to make the Big 12 as stable and strong as you looked at the SEC and, and, and what they had to offer was? Sure. Yeah, one of the things you, you, know, you have to think about is uh, if we stay, what happens to the Big 12? And one of those things is what what's the future look like and what can it possibly add or do and those kinds of things. So that, that has to be part of the thought process of the forecast of the Big 12 in 2025 and beyond. What did the Big 12 do wrong so that it wasn't as stable and safe as the SEC was from your world view in 2020? Let, let me Where do we get it wrong back in the day? Yeah, let me be clear. You're, you're, I think you're, you're framing it as if it was a choice made by the Big 12 as a conference. No, and I'm not. You, you said, what did the Big 12 do wrong? That's well, what, what, doing ha- is, is what happened that the Big 12 was not ah, okay. as good okay. as the That's, SEC from your point of view? Yeah, I'm more comfortable with that. So, so you lay out where the, where the trends are going in the world around us and back to just, and I'll take one little facet. This is not the only thing, just help sort of articulate where, I'm, where, mm-hmm. where my thought process was. Take the pattern towards name, name image, and likeness. Mm-hmm. So NIL is gonna drive more choices by young people to decide where they wanna play, sports period, but football in particular, right? So their particular exposure platform ability to be in the public eye will drive part of their expected perceived brand value as a student athlete. And in my opinion, the SEC has more upside as a platform to enhance our student athletes brand than the Big 12 does. But I'm looking historically. So let's say, I mean, did you go back and say, you know, boy, if, if, if you know the Big 12 had kept A&M or invited Houston in or actually expanded and done things, they would have had that stability. So there's name like this image in the Supreme Court cases came down we would have been in that same spot. Did you go back and, and say, maybe there's some healthy retrospect that had these things happened differently, the Big 12 would have been in that same position as you viewed the SEC? Yeah, maybe this will impugn me as a leader in your eyes, but no, sir. I mean, I'm, I'm a forward-looking person. Um, so thinking about where are things heading, I did think through what can the Big 12 get to that SEC-like uh, future. And in my estimation, it was a low probability event. Well, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you kind of from, from my perspective as a guy, obviously representing Lubbock in Texas, sure. like we look back and think, you know, I look back and think, you know, the Big 12 could have been that stable had maybe, you know, we not run A&M out of the conference. And I, I lay that at the feet of, you know, certain decisions that were made, you know, Nebraska and, and Colorado. And we've done certain things along the way. And a lot of those had to do, I think, with, you know, this Longhorn Network. At least that's what we get the feeling talking there. So I, I just wonder, do you think that's part of the reason the Big 12 was, you know, more unsafe and you know not stable because of those events that had transpired over the years i was not in the seat i can tell you that, let me try a couple of things part one is i agree the big 12 will be healthier with a and we're in it sure part two is and this is part of maybe it's just my own training and my own thought process one of the first days in finance class i used to teach was about sunk costs things that you can't change you don't worry about you make decisions looking forward on things that are possible to change i can't change what happened then all I can affect is, given the hand we're dealt today, how do I play the cards the best I can? Sure, but you know, from my perspective, maybe UT was the catalyst to making some of those decisions. But let me let me go yeah. a little further. Who owns the Longhorn Network? Oh, like ESPN. Yeah. ESPN. Yeah. How does that work as far as a function with the University of Texas? Because obviously, it's the Longhorn Network. Do you have actual, you know, athletics people in there dealing with them day to day and helping with programming and content and things? I honestly don't know how the programming decisions are made. That's something I could find out for you, but I don't know today. Okay. But, but so it's it's a function of ESPN. How often and frequently does you know your athletic director and you talk to Longhorn Network and talking about you know where the future of college sports is heading and things like that? Uh, I have not heard of such a conversation, but I'm not, can't tell you today how often they happen. When you were sitting there looking at all the different options for the future of University of Texas, did you consult in any way with the people at the Longhorn Network to talk to them about what they saw the future being? Yeah, no, let me, let me be clear. In, in my mind, I want to be clear to the, the previous questions. I can't remember if uh, Senator Hughes, it was your question. But when I said I talked to nobody at ESPN, that would include the, ES, the Longhorn Network as a subset of ESPN. So as you're starting to kind of think tank about the future of UT, I mean, did you expand it to 
people outside of your small bubble? I mean, did you actually get external people in there thinking about it, or was it just you and the athletic director and a few others? Yeah, it was it, uh, the decision making team is largely the, the the chairman, me, the athletic director, and then you know at the right time we might bring in uh, the athletic director has a, a, a trusted number two who's been at lots of universities and he was part of the conversation at the right point in time. So it was, but it was an inner inner team. Four people. At, at the at the genesis, yes, sir. Okay. And then did you expand it to get some outside perspective to say, is this really a good thing for the University of Texas? And is there a way to actually rebuild the Big 12? Did you get any outside perspective? Or did you just kind of make this with only four people at the table? It was made by a UT leadership team without going outside the walls of UT to provide outside perspectives. Did you make contact with other conferences? Um, I did not, no. Okay. Did Mr. Del Conte or anybody else? I don't, I, I can't, I, can, I don't want to attest to what, if you knew Chris Del Conte, you'd hate to attest to what he does or doesn't do. Um, I don't know of any contact he made. Um, so it was certainly not in my direction. Okay, well, but did you, did, did, did you all explore the idea of going to the, you know, the PAC or the Big Ten or ACC versus the SEC? Yes, sir. Okay, and I'll, but do you know if those invitations were open? We never, re as I told you before, we, I never reached out. At what point in time did you feel on solid ground that the invitation to the SEC would be extended? Was that in the spring of 2020 or was that oh. a little bit later? Chairman yeah. Burroughs, let's get to the end of these questions, too. I'll be brief after this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, we got comfortable that um, if we went down that path, we'd have a home, I would call it, in the summer. Did you use the fact that you were leaving the Big 12 and helping recruiting college athletes or coaches to UT? No. All right, my last question, you talked about how you're in this unique situation at UT, you know, the biggest athletic budget in the entire nation, you actually athletic subsidize academics. Are you going to use this increased revenue, whatever you get from it, to help offset maybe state appropriations needs? Oh, no, I, my, my goal is to make the university more excellent. Okay. And displacing current dollars with other dollars doesn't help that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Anderson, Representative Anderson. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Appreciate you being here and spending this time with us. Um, on your initial contact with the SEC uh, and your thought process that the uh, Big 12 had some weaknesses, uh, was there any, uh, and you mentioned that in making a decision to go to the SEC, it wasn't just money and it wasn't the media. What other item would you say offhand that might be considered oh uh yeah i mean you can uh, a, a few more things you can imagine overall um <laughs> brand reputation exposure uh global presence so much of the same reasons that the presidents and chancellors talked about the impact on their institutions of a healthy sports enterprise we still face the same thing and if we are more present and win more more students will think of us and we'll be front of mind for for more potential students not just student athletes ability to recruit uh, we hope better student athletes. Was there Alumni, any I'm sorry. Go ahead. Was there any conversation at that point of a mega conference? No. Did you have any conversation with the SEC at any point in time of a mega conference? No. Do you know if OU, vis-a-vis -vis UT, had any conferences? Don't know. No. Um, the um, Do you have? Can you say at this point in time? Do you have any anticipation or expectations of a mega conference, oh, 20 I, 30 teams that might end up further hurting the Big 12 and other conferences? I don't have any deeper insights than the other presidents and chancellors and certainly the commissioner uh, standing here today. So we all probably read the same, you know, stories and projections and thoughts. Okay, and to just end, sum it up, you said that you didn't know what the long-term effects of a mega conference might be. In your heart of hearts, do you currently think uh, that that may be a potential. I, oh, I, th I think it's one of the things you, you can imagine could happen. I mean, for all the reasons that we're all worried about it here today, um, I think, you know, I, I think about the same economic forces that are at act in, uh, on all the schools, and you could see consolidation into, into fewer conferences, and the mega conference is a limit, I assume you mean a limiting case of one of those. Um, so it's, it, it's possible, but on the other hand, you look at what happened in, in in soccer or football, depending on what, what phrase you use in Europe. And they, they, they went forward with the idea and it didn't last very long. So 
<coughs> there might be reasons why it doesn't 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 ever get that far. Well, that'd be something I'd be uh, very concerned about. <clears throat> Appreciate your candor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Other questions, members? Thank you so much, President Hartzell. I, I, it bears pointing out, members, that there is no law preventing UT from making this move. And as Senator Whitmire points out, nobody passed a law when uh, A&M left. Each institution has a right and a responsibility, I would say, to look out for what's best for each institution. On this panel, it is our responsibility to do what's right for Texas. And I'm not talking about that Texas, I'm talking about- Big Texas. The state of Texas, not just the university. And I think today's testimony members has given us a lot to think about, not only from an economic standpoint, but about things we need to focus on moving forward to make sure that all of our institutions and Senator Taylor, all of our students, I love what you said, are in the best possible position to succeed in this new landscape of college sports. I wanna thank everyone, members. I wanna thank all of you for your patience. I thought excellent points were brought out. Um, thank you to those who stayed and endured this testimony, to the House members who are here because there's no quorum over there and we couldn't have a hearing over there. We thank you for your participation. And um, it's such an important dialogue that I'm sure will continue in the weeks to come. So is there any other business to come before this committee? Hearing none, we are going to stand in recess subject to the call of the chair. Thank you.